Let me know if you can see me and hear me. I'm just trying to see if I'm here. Hello, Tina. Tina? Tina. I hope that's how I say your name. Um, it is really nice to have you here. Good evening. It is 7 p.m. This is generally when we will have our English lessons every day. Hello. Um, this is the first time you're seeing me here, so I think we should start with introductions. I'm Shri. I'm an English educator for, well, I teach grades 11 and 12, but I teach grade 12 on another channel right now. Here, I am going to be part of the Zero to Hero crash course that is happening this month, where we are going to cover the entirety of all the 11th grade portions within the course of a month. Um, with English, I think that will be a little bit easier than with the other subjects because we don't have a lot of very heavy content in English. Um, but we do have a lot of fun lessons that we can read together and understand better together. More about me. Um, I did my BA Honours in English. Um, I've just finished my graduation. I really love English. I love literature in general. So my favorite part of all of our classes is definitely going to be the literature segments. Um, but I will also be taking some reading comprehension practices. We'll be doing some grammar together and we will definitely be doing some writing together. I know that this time around CBSE has switched to an MCQ pattern, but being familiar with all of the formats and being familiar with the kind of content that you need to produce in these writing samples, for instance, um, is generally useful and also useful for the MCQ tests as well because you'll get tested on those things too. Um, that is a general like overview of the things that we're going to be doing together this month also. One more thing that I should let you know is that I speak in English, as you can see. Um, that's because I don't know Hindi. So if by any chance um, you're finding that you have some sort of trouble following me, then please feel free to ask me to slow down. Please feel free to ask me questions about the things I'm saying, what I mean, anything like that. I will be looking at the chat regularly. So if you have any issues at all, let me know there and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Hello to Vedant and Dhruv. Um, there are a lot of you here, which is really nice. Before we start, I want to ask you something. Um, what, por what part of your English portions do you have the most trouble with? I asked this in another place and everyone said grammar. Um, but you tell me, what do you struggle with? What do you like? Um, what do you think maybe we should focus on a little bit more during this month? That'll help me figure out, you know, what exactly we need to work on together. I will remember your name though. Okay, snapshot is something you struggle with. Yeah, I can see why. Um, it's very different from the way Hornbill goes, right? Um, snapshots is much more look at the lesson and sort of what do you think about the lesson and what are your insights about the things that this lesson is saying. I'm hoping that some of the conversations that we'll be having around the rest of the chapters will also help you figure out how to do that. But we'll also be doing snapshots, yeah. Good evening, Prem, and good evening, Aryan. Nice to have you all here. We're gonna start our lesson in a bit. But for those of you who've just joined, again, quick introduction. I'm Shri. I'm going to be the English educator for grade 11 for now. Um, we're going to be doing all of the portions of grade 11 within the course of a month. Okay, and Aryan says the problem that we've been having is grammar and writing. Yeah, I understand that. 
yeah true snapshot is a little bit more difficult um that's deliberately like that they want to give you like different kinds of things to read but we'll be going through the difficult words also so that should help too i hope oh yeah discovering tet is a such an odd lesson i understand why you might have trouble with that <laughs> I read it the first time and I was like this is a bit of a dry lesson how do we make it interesting um and then I tried and we'll try to make it interesting this time around too okay um I can see that I have got a bunch of people here listening let me know at any point at all um what you may be having issues with what you may be need help with and you can leave it in the form of comments also if you see this later um and i will definitely take a look and i will plan the rest of the month as per what you may need the most help with rather than necessarily just going syllabus uh, going per the like regulatory syllabus schedule but for today we're going to be starting with our very first lesson and i've put the phone aside now so i'm going to be talking to you about the lesson itself but i will come back in brief breaks to check to see if you have any questions so feel free to ask questions um one thing before we begin we meet every day except sundays uh from 7 to 8 pm so be here and we will do a lot of english together i also want to let you know that there's this telegram channel for ecobiz which some of you if you've been following this channel you may already be part of but if you are new here then you can look in the description box for the link of the channel um and you can join it and basically you'll get updates about what classes are happening when which should be easier than just following us on youtube um today we're going to be doing the portrait of a lady by kushan singh and i am pulling out my trusty laser pointer um Arin says that you you're done with term one portions. Oh, that's good. Um, we're going to be doing term one portions here because this is kind of revision for term one. So if you listen, maybe it will help you revise. Okay, the portrait of a lady by Kushan Singh. Um, interesting title. First of all, um, portrait. what is a portrait a portrait is an image of a person right um generally a painting of a person but also these days if you pull out your phone and you go on like portrait mode then you get a photo that is focused on the person and sort of blurs out the rest of the background right um so what we get from the word is that it's an image of a person in detail um and here in this particular story kushan singh is going to be offering us a portrait but not a literal portrait right he is going to be offering us a word portrait he is going to be painting us a character sketch um like the old questions in your old exam papers where you'd be asked to write like an um a 10 mark question like on a character sketch of a person yeah something like that except he is going to be doing it across like a four page story and it's going to be about a lady and as we get into the lesson we will find out who this lady is and i want to it's his grandmother so let's start with one question about all of you which is what is your relationship with your grandparents like and you can let me know in the chat do you see them a lot do you meet them do you maybe live with them because i used to live with my grandparents sorry about that my laptop glitches a lot <laughs> through i'm sorry i don't i don't know hindi um I can understand some of it if it's spoken but I can't speak it myself. I have a feeling if I try my grammar will be like extremely extremely bad. People have 
all sorts of relationships with their grandparents. Um, in my case, for instance, um, I used to be really close to my grandparents when I was much younger because we all lived in the same house together. But now I've grown up and I live in an entirely different place and I see my grandparents like maybe once a year. And so the relationship has sort of become not as close. You know, there's a bit of distance put in there, partly because of physical distance. And in this relation, in this particular story, we see this kind of changing relationship between a grandmother and a grandson. And we also get a very close look at the factors of change. What do I mean by that? By that I mean at all of the things that make this relationship change. Um, and we'll be discovering what they are as we read the lesson. So we're going to be reading the actual lesson now and what we'll do is we'll read a paragraph, we'll try to understand the paragraph and after we're done with that we'll discuss a couple of themes that we get from the paragraph so that we're kind of very thoroughly covered with that paragraph. Let me know if that sounds okay um, and I will go ahead and start. My grandmother, like everybody's grandmother, was an old woman. She had been old and wrinkled for the 20 years that I had known her. From the very first word, the first thing that we know about this story is that the grandmother in the story is an old woman. And the author tells us, she has been old and wrinkled for the 20 years that I've known her. So we get two things from this. One, um, the author is probably somewhere in his 20s. Um, and two, the only image that the author has of his grandmother is of an old woman. Um, and that's kind of the image that most people have of their grandmothers, right? Uh, somebody who is sort of tiny and old and has like a lot of white hair. And that's what the author means when he says, like everybody's grandmother. So when we think of the word grandmother in common culture, the idea that crops up in our heads is of old people. People said that she had once been young and pretty and had even had a husband, but that was hard to believe. So other people tell the narrator that, you know, once upon a time your grandmother was young and when she was young she was really pretty, she was married to this person and the narrator's like, I can't believe that, that doesn't make sense to me. And the reason it doesn't make sense to him is because in his mind, again, his grandmother is an old lady, right? She could never have been young. She could never have been pretty and she could never have had a husband, which means the role that she's occupied in his life has always been that of grandmother. And so he can't imagine her being a wife. My grandfather's portrait hung above the mantelpiece piece in the drawing room. He wore a big turban and loose fitting clothes. His long white beard covered the best part of his chest and he looked at least a hundred years old. Mantelpiece? It's um, a sort of, um, have you, if you have like a really fancy drawing room, then you generally have like spaces where you can put things up for showing it off to people who come into the room. So a place like that is a mantelpiece. Um, it's generally above like a fireplace. It's like a solid like plank above the fireplace on which you can put things. And in this case, there is a mantelpiece in their house and the grandfather's portrait hangs above the mantelpiece. So we have an actual painting here. And how does the grandfather look? He wears a big turban, he wears really loose fitting clothes, he has a long white beard and he looks very, very old. Um, even despite the fact that this portrait is right there in the house and it's of the grandfather who was once married to the grandmother, the author and the narrator. Sort of like, mm, mm, what? They were married? He did not look the sort of person who would have a wife or children. He looked as if he could only have lots and lots of grandchildren. Similar to the grandmother, the grandfather also looks so old that the author can't believe that it's possible for him to have ever had a wife or ever had children. He only looks like he could have lots and lots of grandchildren. As for my grandmother being young and pretty, the thought was almost revolting. Revolting? Disgusting. The author thinks about it and he is sort of repelled. He doesn't want to think about it anymore. 
She often told us of the games she used to play as a child. That seemed quite absurd and undignified on her part, and we treated it like the fables of the prophets she used to tell us. So this grandmother regularly tells the author and maybe other grandchildren um, stories about the times when she was a child and what sort of games she used to play, which is the kind of storytelling that family engages in, right? especially like grandparents. Um, except in this particular case, uh, the author hears the stories and he's like, that sounds absurd, which is to say ridiculous and undignified, which is to say when he looks at his grandmother, he sees a woman who is very serious. So when he thinks about her playing games, he thinks that that's absolutely wrong for somebody who is so serious and that she shouldn't play games because that is quite a silly activity that old people don't do, right? So he can't reconcile this idea of a child who's playing games and having fun with his grandmother who is quite old and serious. and. We treated it like the fables of the prophets she used to tell us. And what does that phrase mean? Um, fables of the prophets that she used to tell us. So grandmother also tells them stories about the prophet. Um, fables, fables are stories, right? Um, they're sort of short stories that you know are fictional. You know they're not completely a part of your real life. So you know when you're listening to them that you shouldn't entirely believe what you're being told. And that's why that comparison is being made. Um, we're being told that when the author hears all these stories, he can't entirely believe them. And he sort of looks at them like he looks at all of these fictional tales. And he's like, I, you know, this isn't completely reality. Um, yeah, now I'm gonna look at the chat to see if you have questions. She had always been short and fat and slightly bent. Her face was a crisscross of wrinkles running from everywhere to everywhere. No, we were certain she had always been as we had known her. The grandmother is short, she's fat, she's slightly bent, she has wrinkles that are going from every part of her face to every other part of her face. And this convinces them that, yes, she's always been as we've known her, which is old, so terribly old that she could not have grown older and had stayed at the same age for 20 years. She looks so old that they can't look at her and think of her as ever having been younger. They think she's looked this way and been the same age for 20 years. What does this mean? This means, um, um, say the grandmother is 60 and the author has known her since she was 40, right, for the last 20 years. But when he looks at her at the age of 60, he thinks she's been 60 for all of these 20 years. She was never really 40 years old. So she was never really that much younger. She's always, always been exactly as old as I see her right now. And this is a common thing that happens to us with people in our lives. Um, and we'll talk about that theme in a moment. She could never have been pretty, but she was always beautiful. Here we have a contrast that's being made between pretty and beautiful. Um, and the author is telling us she was never pretty. And so pretty becomes something that's associated with youth and not with old age, right? Um, because the idea that an old person can be pretty seems very revolting to the author. But this woman is always beautiful. And we'll find out how the author defines beautiful in a little bit. She hobbled about the house in spotless sweat, with one hand resting on her waist to balance her stoop and the other telling the beads of her rosary. So she has a stoop, which means that she is bent. Um, she wears white all the time and it's very clean. And she hobbles around the house, which is to say she isn't, she can't walk entirely well. Um, she probably balances on one side more than the other. 
and she uses a hand on her waist so she kind of like puts her hand like this and she walks um, which must mean that she's bent on the other side um, so she's balancing the stoop by putting a hand on her waist and what is her other hand doing her other hand is telling the beads of her rosary um, what does that mean telling the beads of her rosary means that she is saying prayers as she counts through the rosary and a rosary is basically a you know a string of beads that's put together and you use it for your prayers her silver locks were scattered untidily over her pale puckered face puckered um it's the face that you make when you say bite on lemon and your face kind of like scrunches in that kind of face is known as puckered so again that's uh, her entire face has kind of come in which happens because of old age she has white hair and her lips constantly moved in inaudible prayer and she is always saying prayers under her breath you can't hear them but you know that she is praying yes she was beautiful she was like the winter landscape in the mountains an expanse of pure white serenity breathing peace and contentment so here we get told why the grandmother is beautiful right and it's because she is peaceful and she is very content and when you look at her you can see that peace and you can see that contentment and so you think oh this is a beautiful person and so beauty in this particular story gets associated with that kind of peace and contentment rather than with youth um so that's the distinction that's being made between being pretty and being beautiful in the story and you should remember that yeah we've done all of this serenity is um calmness that's what that's from here and in this particular story in this particular paragraph sorry we get a bunch of characteristics about the grandmother right um we get first a bunch of her physical traits she is bent over she is fat she is slightly stooped she wears white she has white hair her face is puckered all of these things and we also get a bunch of personality traits so far in this story and they are she likes telling stories to her grandchildren um she also seems to be religious as a person because not only is she telling a rosary all the time she is whispering prayers under her breath all the time and another thing that we get is that she seems very peaceful and contented and that makes her beautiful so we've gotten a bunch of traits here and so far we've also gotten one other thing that's really important and that is how people look at old age um in this case we're looking at it from the perspective of a very young person right we're looking at it from the perspective of the author who is extremely young in comparison to his grandmother and we're looking at the way he thinks about old age and old people when he sees them which is that they can't possibly have been different than they are now which is also to say i can't imagine this person ever having been different than the person that they were when i met them which is something that all of us do right we meet a person and um we get used to them as they are and when we find out that possibly they had like an entirely different life before we knew them we're extremely shocked because we can't imagine this person doing all of those things and that's what's happening to the author in this particular case that it happens with old age is also interesting because society has a very particular like view of old age right we look at old age and we're sort of like that's that's like a moment when this person is very respectable and very serious and we should treat them with a lot of respect but these old people whom we put all of these characteristics onto also had a very different like personality they have a lot more to them than just that than just what old age has given them and we get glimpses of that in these two paragraphs my grandmother and i were good friends My parents left me with her when they went to live in the city and we were constantly together. So the author and the grandmother have lived together and they lived together back when his parents went away to live in the city and they left him with her. And so in that period of time they were always together because they lived together and they were very good friends. She used to wake me up in the morning and get me ready for school. 
She said her morning prayer in a monotonous sing-song while she bathed and dressed me in the hope that I would listen and get to know it by heart. Every morning, the grandmother wakes him up, she gets him ready for school, and while she is bathing him and she is dressing him, she always says her morning prayer and she says it in a monotonous sing-song. Monotonous um, means repetitive, very dull kind of, um, you know, uh, way of singing. So the tune is very repetitive and there's no real life in it. And the reason that she says the prayer every day is in the hope that I would listen and get to know it by heart. She's hoping that the author will memorize um, the prayers just because he's listening to it all the time. I listened because I loved her voice but never bothered to learn it. And the author listens because he likes the way his grandmother sounds but he never really learns it. And this gives us a very interesting thing um, that isn't directly connected to the lesson, but I want to add it in very quickly, which is that you can listen to something every day and you can still absolutely just not learn it, right? So you wanting to learn it also plays a role in the entire like act of learning something. And also presumably the other person has to be like relatively good at what they're telling you for you to be able to learn it. But yeah, very interesting like tidbit about learning that you get from this one line. Then she would fetch my wooden slate, which she had already washed and plastered with yellow chalk, a tiny earthen ink pot, and a red pen, tie them all in a bundle, and hand it to me. After a breakfast of a thick, stale chapati with a little butter and sugar spread on it, we went to school. So the grandmother also gets the wooden slate, which the author writes on, because these are very old times. Um, she's washed the, uh, the slate and she's put chalk on it so that he can write on it and he has like this like tiny ink pot and he has a pen. She puts them together, she packs his bag basically and she gives it to him and then they eat breakfast together and breakfast is stale chapati which means it's probably from the previous day and they put a little butter on it, they put a little sugar on it, um, they eat it and then they go to school and she carries like some of the chapatis with her for the village dogs. Um, yeah, I told you what monotonous means. Um, my grandmother always went to school with me because the school was attached to the temple. The priest taught us the alphabet and the morning prayer. So the school that the author goes to is a school that is organized by the temple. And in fact, it's the priest who is their teacher. And the priest teaches them not only the alphabet, which all of us are used to learning in school, but also the morning prayer, which is to say religion is also being taught in the school. So it's both alphabet, which is what we traditionally, conventionally learn, and the prayer, um, which is a much more religious thing that is also the religious side of study that the author is getting. While the children sat in rows on either side of the veranda, Singing the alphabet or the prayer in a chorus, my grandmother sat inside reading scriptures. The grandmother also comes with the author whenever he goes to school and while he is learning, um, so you know the children, all of the students learning will be sitting there and singing the alphabet or they'll be singing the prayer and the grandmother will be sitting inside and she'll be reading the scriptures which are the religious books um, which tells us yet again she is extremely religious, right? When we had both finished, we would walk back together. This time, the village dogs would meet us at the temple door. They followed us to our home, growling and fighting with each other for the chapatis we threw to them. When they were both done with their respective work, the grandmother and the grandson would go back home together. While they were walking back home, the village dogs would come and meet them and they would throw them chapatis. Um, they, being the grandmother the grandson, would throw the dogs chapatis and the dogs would fight each other for the chapatis and make those growly noises and eat the chapatis as, they, um, as the two people, the grandmother and the grandson, go home. Um, we get a lot of things from these paragraphs, but a couple of quick things that we'll talk about. Um, one, this is at a point of time when they are 
this author is still young enough that he needs somebody to like bathe him and to dress him, which tells us childhood. And we can see that the grandmother has taken on not only the role of a friend, but also the role of a care caregiver, right? Um, his primary guardian is his grandmother. So they spend a lot of time together and they have the routine that builds their entire days together. And by this I mean that from the morning to the evening, every bit of their days is in some way or the other interlinked with the others, right? Um, and we can also see that the grandmother really, really wants the author to be religious. Um, she wants her grandson to be religious to the extent that she sings these prayers in the morning. And also the school that he's been put in is one in which he will be taught about religion. So religion is something so serious to her that she wants to pass that on to her grandson. But we can also see already that there are hints of the grandson not taking religion that very seriously because he's not really like learning the prayers that the grandmother is singing to him every morning. Okay, give me a second. I'm just going to get some water because my throat is dying. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm looking at the chat now. Questions and it is already 7:30, and so we will have to go a little bit faster. Um, when my parents were comfortably settled in the city, they sent for us. There is a change of location that takes place in this particular paragraph, where they were previously in some other place, um, far from the city that the parents were in. Now. We've all moved into the city. The grandmother and the grandson have moved in with the parents, which means also that the primary caregivers are now the parents and not the grandmother. So that's bound to change things in the relationship between the grandmother and the grandson, right? And we see that immediately, that was a turning point in our friendship. And that instantly changes something. Although we shared the same room, my grandmother no longer came to school with me. I used to go to an English school in a motor bus. There were no dogs in the streets, and she took to feeding sparrows in the courtyard of our city house. So the two of them still live in the same room together, which means that they're still connected in a little, in this very small way. If you share a room with someone, you can't help seeing them sometimes, right? Um, when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you go to your room to get something. In all of these moments, you'll still meet them, you'll still talk to them a little bit. So there's still something of a relationship there. But we're also told that the usual routine that the grandmother and the grandson shared is completely destroyed. The grandmother and the grandson no longer go to school together. Instead, the grandson now goes to an English school, which is to say not a school attached to a temple, and he goes in a motor bus. And there are no dogs on these streets, so the grandmother has taken to feeding sparrows. They're her new dogs, so to speak. Um, and this also tells us something about the grandmother again, which is that she likes animals. She likes having a relationship with animals. And so when she can't feed dogs, she feeds sparrows instead. As the years rolled by, we saw less of each other. For some time, she continued to wake me up and get me ready for school. When I came back, she would ask me what the teacher had taught me. And as the years go on, both of these people see less and less of each other, even though they're in the same room. Um, the grandson tells us that for some period of time, the grandmother still used to wake him up and still used to get him ready. So she's still taking part in taking care of him just a little bit. Um, and then when he comes back home, she's still trying to get to know him. And so she asks him things like, how did your day go? Or how was school today? Um, I would tell her English words and little things of Western science and learning. The law of gravity, Archimedes' principle, the world being round, etc. And the grandson tries to engage also, right? He tells her about the things that he learns in school. He says, oh, I learned this Western thing, this other science thing. I learned about gravity. I learned about Archimedes' principle. <laughs> this is a lot of science examples. Um, the world being round. 
and all of these are immediately we can see again very different from the things that he was learning in that school in the temple this made her unhappy and when she hears that this is what he is learning the grandmother is unhappy why for a couple of reasons she could not help me with my lessons she did not believe in the things they taught us at the english school and was distressed that there was no teaching about god and the scriptures so first she is in familiar with all of these ideas so she can no longer help her grandson learn his lessons which means automatically that in some way she is a little less useful to her grandson right and people take that very badly um if for instance your parents have been like helping you with homework and things like that and at some point you get to a point where they can no longer help you because you're learning very specialized things then they're going to feel a little bad that they can't help you anymore because they found some sort of joy in being able to help you and so that kind of joy has been taken from the grandmother in this case another thing that also distresses her is simply the fact that all of these things that the grandson is now studying are things she has never heard of and things that she doesn't really think are real because she's been brought up in a very different period of time and she's been brought up to believe in very different things and she thinks of very different things as being important and serious and some of those are god and the scriptures and these are the things that he is not learning anymore right and that upsets her because as we know she is very serious about religion and the fact that her grandson isn't going to like learn anything about religion means that he isn't taking something seriously that is very important to her which is also something that can create little wrinkles in relationships that's a very bad point in this case um one day i announced that we were being given music lessons she was very disturbed to her music had lewd associations um one day the grandson says that they're going to be taught music in school and the grandmother is extremely upset because music has lewd associations so what does that mean um lewd means unclean um disgusting revolting um so when she thinks about music and learning music all of these are the words that crop up in her mind right um music is just like this that's what she thinks about music it was the monopoly of harlots and beggars and not meant for gentle monopoly monopoly means exclusive property so according to the grandmother it is only harlots who are people which is a word it's a derogatory word for people who are sexually promiscuous um so people who engage in sex in a way that is considered negative uh, so it has a connotation around it the word harlot and it's a bad connotation and beggars which is to say people who don't have money and that also has a negative connotation in the sense that here we're seeing a bit of a class divide right we see harlots and beggars on one end and we see gentle folk on another end and we're getting told that gentle folk are better than harlots and beggars so there is a class hierarchy at play here and as per the class hierarchy that is at play these gentle folk are better than harlots and beggars and harlots and beggars can do music but gentle folk are too good for that that's the implication of this line um gentle folk is an interesting way to think about this family because it also gives us a hint about the title of this story you say when you say gentle folk you mean gentlemen and gentle lady that's how you uh, refer to men and women when it comes to gentle folk um and so the reason that the title might say, might say lady instead of woman or grandmother or something like that might be a hint to the fact that the grandmother finds some kind of pride in being part of the gentle folk and she finds that it's important enough that when the author when the narrator both when her grandson does music lessons she is upset about it she said nothing but her silence meant disapproval she rarely talked to me after that she doesn't really tell him anything about it but the fact that she doesn't tell him anything means that she doesn't like what he is doing and then after that she doesn't really talk to him much so we can see that this incident has really upset her we get a bunch of themes here again um we see first a change in space they move to the city we also see a change in age 
the narrator, the grandson is clearly growing older. Um, we see also that there is still some closeness in sharing a space. They still see each other at some points of the day. But we also see that there is distance that is developing in the relationship between the grandmother and the grandson. Um, and this is because of two things, right? One of it is circumstance, simply the fact that the grandson is now going to a very different school, which means that he is learning very different things, which is a consequence of the generation that he is part of and what the generation values, which is really just a condition of time and things that are moving and things that are changing and things that are going on. Um, so nobody can really be blamed for circumstance. And we also say that distance is being caused by disagreement. And the disagreement is because of the circumstance. Um, and the disagreement is because the grandmother can no longer understand things that the grandson does. And she can't really approve or like any of the things that her grandson is doing. So not only is she now no longer spending most of the day with him because he is off in the school away from her, she also no longer really has any sort of a, an intimate understanding bond with him. When I went up to university, I was given a room of my own. Completely new face again. And so far we've seen like two faces in their relationship. One where they're very close, one where they're drifting apart. And the third is when the grandson is going to university. And then he's given a room of his own. The common link of friendship was snapped. And so that space which was still keeping them a little in touch with each other is gone and so that thread of connection that they still had is also like I was gonna torn. Um, my grandmother accepted her seclusion with resignation. Seclusion means complete isolation, right? She is all alone now. She doesn't talk to anybody much. She doesn't engage with anybody much and she accepts it except with resignation. And resignation means that you're accepting something because you're doomed to it and there is no other way out of this, right? It's not because you want this, it's because you don't have another choice. And what this tells us is that maybe, sorry, what we're getting here is that after the grandson moves out of the room, the grandmother is completely isolated. Which means that maybe the only person she really had anything of a relationship with in this family is her grandson. She rarely left her spinning wheel to talk to anyone. From sunrise to sunset, she sat by her wheel spinning and reciting prayers. Only in the afternoon, she relaxed for a while to feed the sparrows. So from day to night, she sits by her spinning wheel and she spins cloth. And she is always, always, as we know about the grandmother already, reciting prayers constantly. And in the afternoon, she takes a small break and she goes and she feeds the sparrows. So these two things remain constant about the grandmother's personality. One, she is always saying prayers. Two, she is still very, very caring when it comes to her relationships with animals. While she sat in the veranda, breaking the bread into little bits, hundreds of little birds collected around her, creating a veritable bedlam of chirpings. Veritable bedlam of chirpings. Veritable means definite. Um, bedlam means chaotic. Chirpings is the sound that the birds are making, so they're making like a lot of chaotic noise. Um, and there are hundreds of birds, which is to say she's been feeding a lot of birds. And she's sitting there, she's tearing the birds, the bread into pieces, and she's throwing it after them. Some came and perched on her legs, others on her shoulders, some even sat on her head. She smiled, but never shooed them away. It used to be the happiest half hour of the day for her. So these birds know the grandmother so well that they feel comfortable sitting on her, which means that they trust her and she's never harmed them. And we can see that here too. She smiles, but she doesn't like chase them off her. She lets them sit on her. So she's finding some sort of companionship with these birds. And she's enjoying the fact that they like her enough to like sit on her and be around her. And in fact, it becomes the part of her day that makes her the happiest. Yeah, I already told you what these words mean. We get, again, a couple of themes that we already sort of discussed. 
One is how physical distance leads to even more distance between these two characters. Another is how possibly her grandson was her closest friend and when he moved out she had nobody left so she's extremely secluded and so she withdraws to doing her own things. You know, she prays, she spins and she retreats to spending time with animals because all of this can still give her joy. Um, even if spending time with people doesn't necessarily give her any kind of support or joy. When I decided to go abroad for further studies, I was sure my grandmother would be upset. I would be away for five years and at her age, one could never tell. But my grandmother could. She was not even sentimental. The grandson decides that he is going to go abroad to study and it's going to be a five-year program that he is going for and he thinks that his grandmother is going to be very upset at this. And why does he think that? Because at her age, one could never tell. One could never tell what? One could never tell when she's going to die, um, at what point she may die and possibly she might die sometime in the five years that he's away. So he thinks that she'll be upset because he won't be around in what may be the last years of her life. But my grandmother could, could what? Could tell. What does this tell us? That maybe the grandmother does know when she is going to die. She can foretell like her death. And she can foretell that her death is nowhere near. So she's not upset at all when he leaves. She isn't even the slightest bit sentimental. She came to leave me at the railway station but did not talk or show any emotion. Her lips moved in prayer. Her mind was lost in prayer. Her fingers were busy telling the beads of her rosary. She comes to drop him off but when she comes to drop him off, she doesn't speak to him. She doesn't say anything loving or anything like that. She doesn't even express any kind of feeling. She is. Her lips are moving in prayer and her mind is lost in prayer. So she's still saying her prayers. And her mind is also not really there, which is to say she isn't really thinking about that particular circumstance. She isn't really present in the moment. She is somewhere else. She is thinking about God and her fingers, as we know, are doing what they always do, which is telling the beads of her rosary. Silently, she kissed my forehead. And when I left, I cherished the moist imprint as perhaps the last sign of physical contact between us. The grandmother kisses his forehead still without saying anything and the grandson leaves and he is he cherished cherished is treasured the moist imprint um the sort of wetness that the kiss has left on his forehead he treasures it and he thinks this might be the last like kind of physical contact that i have with my grandmother so he really is the one who is worried that his grandmother may die before he comes back but that was not so but she does not die after five years, I came back home and was met by her at the station. He comes back home after five years and once again, grandmother is at the station. She did not look a day older. And this time, she's not aged at all. Um, she looks as old as she ever was, which was how she looked five years ago. Um, she still had no time for words and while she clasped me in her arms, I could hear her reciting her prayers. Even now, she doesn't speak to him. She holds him, but she's still saying her prayers under her breath and he can hear it. Even on the first day of my arrival, her happiest moments were with her sparrows, whom she fed longer and with frivolous rebukes. Even on the day that her grandson comes back, her happiest moments in that day are with her sparrows. You know, that's very interesting because the grandson is someone the grandmother seems to treasure and he's gone off for five years and he's come back after five years and one would think that the most special part of her day would be getting to see him and spending time with him. But here we see that she still finds her happiness in her sparrows. In fact, she feeds them longer than she is used to before. And she feeds them with frivolous rebukes. Um, what does that mean? Rebukes is sort of telling somebody off, scolding them. Frivolous is silly. In this context, it means sort of telling someone off with affection. You know, when you really care about someone and you're sort of like, oh, why are you doing this? No, no, no. And st that was a really bad tone. I'm sorry. But yeah, when you do that, it's a frivolous rebuke. It's sort of an expression of affection rather than really scolding someone. And that's what's going on with that. Uh, the grandmother is sort of gently like teasing her sparrows and she's feeding them. 
And we get three things here. Um, one, we get that idea that the grandmother can tell when she is going to die and when she is not going to die. So maybe she just knows her body really well. Um, another thing we get, another thing we get is how both of them are very very distant from each other now, um, to the extent that the grandmother takes more joy in her sparrows than her grandson and what this tells us is very important right it's not like the grandson has drifted away from his grandmother and she is really sad about it she has also drifted away from her grandson and she is taking joy in different things that's important because we'll come back to it at the very end when we talk about one big thing theme that's there in the story but i'm gonna pause for a moment and see if you have any questions What's the meaning of courtyard? Um, Tina, I'm so sorry, I've just seen that. But a courtyard is the space in which um, you can see the outside world. Generally, in old houses, it used to be sort of like this. Uh, okay, I can't find it. But um, it used to be sort of a central space that was open to the skies. Um, and around it, the house would be built. Um, it's kind of the... It could be like the veranda space now, if that uh, that's a good comparison to what a courtyard is. A yard is basically just a place where you grow like a lot of plants. Um, yeah. So it's like your little garden inside your house or outside your house. Space where basically birds can like fly in easy. I hope that helps. Um, and I hope you hear this maybe later if you aren't here right now. And I'll leave it in the chat before I go also so that if you come back to the chat you can see it. Sorry I didn't check the chat for so long. I just realized that we were really running out of time. So in the evening a change came over her. She did not pray. And something really astonishing happens this specific day. The grandmother doesn't pray and this is the first time that we've known her in this entire story and the first time that the grandson has probably known her in the last 20 years to not pray right oh you're still here good okay i'm glad i hope you like got that meaning she collected the women of the neighborhood got an old drum and started to sing so she gathers up all the women in that neighborhood she gets this old drum and they all start singing together so this is also odd because the grandmother thinks music is not like permissible for people of this particular class, right? But here she is singing. So two odd things that the grandmother is doing. For several hours she thumped the sagging skins of the dilapidated drum and sang of the homecoming of warriors. So what is she singing? She's singing about the homecoming of warriors. So this sounds like one of those old songs about like old myths when you know you're welcoming like people back home. Um, they've gone off to war and they've come back safe. And this is an interesting song choice because the grandson has just come back home today. So in some sense, maybe she is also welcoming him back in this moment. What does this part of the sentence mean? Um, sagging skins of the dilapidated drum. So drums are made with like stretched out, well, they used to be made with stretched out animal skins. Um, and so... That's what the skin part refers to. Um, you bang on it and it makes noise, right? Because of the hollowness. Um, and so these skins on this drum are sort of sagging, which means they're no longer tight, which means the noise they're making is no longer that great. And the reason they're sagging is because the drum is dilapidated, which means that it's old and torn down and worn out. And she is still thumping these like sagging skins. We had to persuade her to stop to avoid overstraining. That was the first time since I had known her that she did not pray. Um, so everybody sort of in the house like goes up to the grandmother and they're like, please, you know, stop. You're straining yourself too much. You're too old to like spend this much energy on this. Um, and the grandson notes, this is the first time that I've known my grandmother to not pray. The next morning she was taken in. It was a mild fever and the doctor told us that it would go, but my grandmother thought differently. She told us that her end was near. 
She said that since only a few hours before the close of the cha last chapter of her life she had omitted to play, she was not going to waste any more time talking to us. And the next morning, which is the morning after the grandmother does something that's very unusual for her, she falls ill and it's a really mild fever and the doctor says, oh, you know, it'll be fine, she'll be fine. Um, and they all probably think, oh, she strained herself yesterday, so Ajito, she is, you know, a little bit ill because of that. Um, but the grandmother, who we know can, like, sort of maybe sense when her death is going to come, thinks differently. She's like, I'm going to die. It's very close. And then she says, yesterday, which was just like a bit before I am on the verge of dying, I forgot to pray. Um, she didn't forget. She omitted. She didn't pray. So today, I'm not going to waste time talking to you. I'm going to pray instead. Um, so she says that. We protested. And everyone around is like, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. And we can't tell what they're protesting what they're protesting. They might be protesting the fact that she thinks she's going to die because they want to reassure her that she will be fine and she'll be completely okay. They might also just want to reassure her, I mean, get her to like talk to them, right? Um, because they're like, okay, if you're going to die, then like talk to us. So we don't know exactly what they protested, but she ignored our protests, but she doesn't listen to them anyway. She lay peacefully in bread, praying and telling her beads. Even before we could suspect her lips stopped moving and the rosary fell from her lifeless fingers. Peaceful pallor spread on her face and we knew that she was dead. So she's lying in bed, she is peaceful, she's praying, her rosary is in her hands. And even before like they notice, she kind of stops, she stills, her mouth stops moving, the rosary falls from her fingers. A pallor spreads on her face, pallor is paleness. It's a sign of lifelessness and that spreads on her face and they immediately know that she's died, she's passed away. Two key things, um, one, the grandmother can sense her own death and that is confirmed for us. Two, in the end when it comes down to it, her gran the grandmother doesn't want to talk to her family, right? Her priority is on her prayers, it's on praying and that's what she does. Um, that's an interesting decision to make because, you know, generally if it's like the last moments of your life, then presumably what you'd want to do is talk to the people that you love. And yet, here the grandmother chooses to play, which tells us again something about priorities and something about what the grandmother really puts value on. And here it's her religion and it's her relationship to God. And so her focus is on the prayers. So when you die, you do things that are important, basically. We lifted her off the bed and as is customary, laid her on the ground and covered her with a red shroud. They take her off the bed and they put her on the ground. Um, they cover her with a red shroud. A shroud is a cloth that you put on people who are dead. Um, this is their custom, which is basically, that's their tradition. After a few hours of mourning, we left her alone to make arrangements for her funeral. They spend a few hours with her and a few hours that they are spending obviously still in shock about her passing and they are mourning her so they are regretting her passing and then they leave her so that they can go and make arrangements to bury her. In the evening, we went to her room with a crude stretcher to take her to be cremated and in the evening they go back and they have this stretcher with them on which they are going to put her so that they can lift her up and take her to the cremation place. The sun was setting and had lit her room and veranda with a blaze of golden light. The sun's going down, it's lit up her room, it's lit up the veranda, everything is golden. And um, this is a bit of a, this is the this is moment that's meant to tell us a little bit that it's also the end of the grandmother's life, right? The sun is setting, it's the end of the day, and in a parallel, it's the end of the grandmother's life. So a moment of sort of symbolism that we get here and it's golden light which is beautiful light um, so this passing isn't really necessarily like it isn't like gloomy you know um, it's it's ending like it's a full life a life led well all of these implications sort of seem to be there in the middle of this this one line they stopped halfway in the courtyard as they're going in to the courtyard um, they stop and they're looking 
because all over the veranda and in her room right up to where she lay dead and stiff wrapped in the red shroud thousands of sparrows sat scattered on the floor every afternoon we know that she feeds sparrows today she is not fed them but um what's happened is the sparrows have shown up anyway and they are scattered all around the room um they are sitting everywhere right until where she is lying dead there was no chirping and they are extremely quiet we felt sorry for the birds and my mother fetched some bread for them she broke it into little crumbs the way my grandmother used to and threw it to them these people see the birds and they feel sorry for the birds because the birds you know have been used to being fed by the grandmother and so the mother goes and gets some bread and she breaks it into crumbs like the grandmother did and she throws the bread to them but the sparrows took no notice of the bread when we carried my grandmother's corpse off they flew away quite next morning the sweeper swept the bread crumbs into the dust but the sparrows don't eat the bread um when these people lift the grandmother and take her out to be cremated all the birds fly off and then they go to the next morning and even the next morning all of those bread pieces are still lying there and the sweeper has to sweep them into the dustbin so these birds have just simply refused to eat the bread and so we get the very last thing about this lesson which is this imagery of morning birds right um, they're mourning the loss of the grandmother too and so in a sign of respect and a sign of love not only are they quiet um silence is a sign of respect they also don't eat the bread and what does that tell us that tells us that they're they're not here only for the bread right they also sort of value the relationship with the grandmother so when the grandmother is gone the bread isn't what's important to them um so we get at the very very end of this chapter this kind of highlight of the relationship between the grandmother and the sparrows and that gives us a little bit of a general theme which is that you can find companionship and love with animals also and so even though maybe the grandmother didn't have very strong relationships with the people in her family anymore she still did have some sort of real connection with these birds and maybe there isn't something that's to be looked down upon or pity but something to be treasured as we can see in this moment when the birds show such deep affection for the grandmother and one last big theme about this entire lesson which is that as we read through this story right um we're seeing a relationship that's falling apart we're seeing a grandson and a grandmother who are completely moving 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 away from each other but we also see no regret um when the grandson talks about this he doesn't say oh i wish i'd been like a better grandson oh i wish i treated my grandmother better and he doesn't seem to think his grandmother has any of those feelings either he doesn't write something for instance like oh my grandmother wished that i spoke to her or my grandmother regretted the fact that i didn't speak to her instead how he writes this drifting apart is with a sense of acceptance he writes it as though it was inevitable this is one of those things that just happened i grew apart from her she grew apart from me i found a different life she found love and affection in different things she found um value in different things i found value in different things and this kind of moving apart of our relationship happened in a way that didn't cause conflict and sharp edges but very organically and sort of peacefully and that's a really nice takeaway for all of us um kind of just the possibility that when relationships fall apart when people that we're close to or people we are no longer close to we can deal with it with this kind of acceptance rather than necessarily regret rather than necessarily um anger and any of those many other feelings that can be responses to such a situation um that is one last thing i want to talk to you about but with that we come to the end of our lesson and we are a little above time i think so thank you so much for being here and listening to me um khatri you have asked me for the meaning of glum glum means moody you know um when you're sort of sulking yeah that's what glum means i hope that helps um but again yeah thank you for being here today 
uh, before you leave, I want to tell you a quick couple of things about an academy. Um, the first thing is that there is something called the Combat Scholarship Test that is going on right now. Um, it is for grade 11. And if you take this test, you have the chance to win scholarships that are worth a lot of money. And how you take this test is you basically enroll for it and it's absolutely free of cost. So just so you know, you don't have to pay. There's nothing you're giving. There's only a chance for you to kind of get a lot from this. So the, the description box has the link for the test and you can click on it and you can enroll and you can take the test and you can try it out. It'll also give you some good revision. See you, Tina. It was lovely to have you. And that is the Unacademy Combat Scholarship Test and you should definitely consider taking it. Um, it'll only take like 45 minutes of your time. Another thing I want to talk to you about is this thing called the Ask It Out segment on the Unacademy app. I don't know if you're on the app but if you are then you should use this and if you're not then you can just download the app and you can very quickly like sign up for it and you can use this feature um, you basically like sign up and you log in and all of this free and you click on ask it out and then you take a picture of whatever question you have and then you send it um, after you select the subject that the question falls under and you will definitely get a reply as to the solution of the question right and that is really convenient because you get a lot of um, you get to basically ask doubts that you have you get to get like your questions cleared if you have exams coming up or you have something that you will learn in school that you're not entirely sure about then this is a way for you to kind of figure out um, an answer to that question and get help for it another thing i want to tell you about is an academy plus which has a lot of really cool features um, you get access to all of the Unacademy content. Um, you get access to study material. Uh, you get access to practice tests and live tests. And you get access to doubt clearing sessions and answer writing sessions, all of which are very useful for exams. We also cover your syllabus really thoroughly. So that is a big bonus of Unacademy Plus. These are the prices of Plus if you want a subscription. As you can see, the prices vary based on the duration that you take the subscription for. And um, the longer that you take the subscription for, the less expensive it is per month. So that's something that you should definitely keep in mind. There's also something called Unacademy Iconic for those of you who are maybe not very interested in collective learning experiences and would rather have like an individual learning experience. So if you're the sort of person who wants somebody to sit down with you and work with you and focus completely on you, then Unacademy Iconic is what would work best for you. You can get all of your doubts cleared here too. You'll work closely with educators one-on-one. -on -one. You'll get weekly reports. Your parents can be in touch with educators and figure out how you're doing. Um, all of these are the benefits of Unacademy Iconic. These are the prices of Iconic. And again, you can see that um, <coughs> The cost is a lot less if you are taking the subscription for a lot longer, the per month cost. So that's something for you to keep in mind. If you want to get either of these subscriptions, I have a code that you can use to get a 10% discount. And my code is THAR01. Um, all that said, thank you for being here with me today on the platform of an academy. If you liked today's session, then do leave a like. Um, do let me know how I can help you better by leaving comments and feedback and definitely subscribe if you like content like this because we have a lot more coming.